watching we are on live you live yeah uh, you are at home yeah uh Sarah, by the way um okay all right okay are we live yes yeah okay good evening everybody and uh, good morning to alexi who is our uh, uh, speaker today dr alexi korolev from uh, canada um alexi got his uh, phd degree in 1989 uh, in uh, central aerolog aerological observatory in moscow In 1994, Alexei joined uh, Environment and uh, Climate Change Canada, where he is working until now. And uh, he is, uh, his primary interest is cloud microphysical processes with emphasis on mixed phase and secondary ice production, airborne instrumentation, in, in situ measurements, and data processing. Alexi has visited our institute, Indian Institute of Tropical Meteorology, a couple, uh, couple of times. And he has indeed given a very enchanting uh, series of lectures at IATM. And uh, we all remember him uh, for that. And thank you so much for accepting our invitation. And uh, please, uh, Alexi, please uh, give your talk. Thank you so much. Hello, everybody. And uh... Tara, thank you very much for inviting me and uh, thanks for your team who is taking over this connection across the globe. Uh, so um, I'll go to my presentation mode, but uh, prior doing this, uh, while we testing, uh, we recognize that there will be uh, uh, maybe some glitches related to uh, high speed videos, which I'm going to show. So and uh, uh, to uh, make it uh, more um, kind of um, less di uh, less disturbance, so I want to just decrease the rate and turn off my uh, video at that point. Um, so uh, do you see my presentation? Yes, yes. OK, so um, today's lecture uh, will be uh, dedicated to uh, secondary ice production, progress and challenges. And uh, uh, so uh, we'll just uh, the emphasis uh, of this talk will be on um, um, overview of laboratory studies of secondary ice production. And uh, I'll bring up a few examples uh, from in situ observations. And uh, we conclude uh, this uh, lecture by discussion uh, about the role of secondary ice production and uh, the way forward. So there are three main modes of uh, generation of ice in the atmosphere. It's uh, homogeneous ice nucleation, which is related to spontaneous freezing of water droplets at a temperature colder than minus uh, 35, minus 40. Uh, the second mode is uh, related to generation of uh, ice uh, uh, ice nuclei, uh, just uh, which may occur in uh, atmosphere at uh, um, relatively high temperatures, higher than minus 35, minus 40, and it requires uh, presence of ice nucleating particles. And secondary ice production, uh, which uh, requires uh, um, uh, pre-existing ice, it involves pre-existing ice, and uh, it generate, uh, the pre-existing ice generate more ice particles. It's like a, like a chain reaction. So the secondary ice production is a two-stage process. Uh, two-stage process. Uh, first, it requires uh, ice, uh, which is uh, generated dur during uh, primary ice production, whether it is uh, uh, a homogeneous ice uh, uh, nucleation, which uh, later on can precipitate down to warmer clouds or homogeneous nucleation, but uh, then it ignites uh, secondary ice production, which may go as a, again as a chain reaction. Uh, the importance of uh, secondary ice production was recognized in uh, in 60s uh, when uh, massive um, uh, measurements, in situ measurements of uh, 
uh, ice uh, particles and uh, ice nuclei became available both from airborne and from uh, from ground. And uh, for example, the uh, diagram on the uh, left it shows the concentrated measured concentration of uh, ice particles. So this uh, uh, blue bluish line it's uh, average uh, concentration uh, deduced by Peter Hobbs and. Uh, uh, the, uh, the bottom bluish line shows um, uh, average concentration of uh, ice nuclei. If, if, if you take the ratio of those, you can see that the difference between the concentration of ice particles and the ice nuclei, uh, it uh, increases with decrease of temperature and that uh, rel uh, relatively high temperatures around minus 5, minus 4, it can reach, go up to uh, four orders of magnitude. So this is outstanding difference, which uh, kind of was uh, just uh, brought a lot of headache to the cloud physics community. And uh, uh, another diagram to look at the, the discrepancies, uh, uh, the just that uh, reddish line shows uh, uh, area here, just it shows uh, the measured concentration of uh, ice particle and uh, this uh, straight line, it uh, just uh, indicate the predicted uh, concentration of uh, ice nuclei, so which should be equal to, approximately equal to concentration of ice uh, particles. It's one of uh, the parameterizations by Fletcher. So uh, it was discovered, it was found that uh, rapid glaciation uh, of uh, convective clouds uh, uh, occurs within a relatively short, uh, short period, which is uh, kind of like 15-20 uh, minutes. And uh, uh, in, inside those clouds, uh, an explosive uh, concentration of ice crystal uh, concentration was observed. And uh, there was a just outstanding inconsistency uh, between the concentration of ice particles and uh, ice nuclei, which is, uh, is uh, talking about. So what is the explanation of this? Uh, there were several uh, three main uh, uh, routes where uh, the cloud physics community way, uh, went along. So it's a uh, compromised INP measurements. Uh, it's, uh, it was uh, thought that INP measurements are uh, underestimated the, the concentration of INP, compromised ice particle measurements. Uh, and uh, the third hypothesis was uh, that uh, there is a uh, some process uh, involved uh, pre-existing ice, which uh, result in uh, ice multiplication. Um, so after improving um, measurements of ice nuclei and uh, <clears throat> in situ measurements, airborne measurements of uh, ice particle concentration, the uh, problem, uh, it was found that uh, the problem persists and uh, for example, this is a, a summary of uh, independent measurements by different research group of uh, concentration of ice nuclei in different regions and different conditions and different uh, temperature ranges. And uh, so, and uh, this uh, gray area shows the measured concentration of uh, ice particles in, uh, in clouds. And we still have this uh, big discrepancy in this area between uh, the observed concentration of ice particles and uh, um, those which uh, were predicted by uh, concentration of ice nuclei. And uh, the diagram on the left shows uh, one of the work by uh, uh, Luis Ladina uh, in uh, uh, measurements in tropical uh, mesoscale convective systems. It shows the uh, difference between the measured concentration of ice crystals, so that's uh, this uh, average line and the predicted concentration based on uh, uh, Paul, Paul de Mott, uh, um, uh equation, which was published in P PNS in uh, 2010. So, and uh, you can see that uh, the difference is uh, quite, quite outstanding between the concentration of uh, INPs and the uh, measured concentration of ice. So what are the mechanisms of secondary ice production? So how to explain all these uh, differences? Uh, early laboratory observations uh, goes back, uh, go back to uh, 40s and, uh, and 50s, but uh, there were a number of uh, laboratory studies uh, showing, indicating those, uh, showing the end of this uh, uh, ice multiplication. But geophysical significance of those uh, observed effects uh, was not well understood by this time. Uh, there was a big uh, 
um, um, uh, lots of laboratory studies uh, starting from beginning of 60s, uh, which uh, uh, and uh, they uh, go go uh, to to 70s and the beginning of 80s. And during this time, uh, six uh, different uh, mechanisms of uh, secondary ice production were recognized. So, and uh, in uh, the following le lecture, just we will just go uh, uh, along those uh, uh, different mechanisms. So, it's a fragmentation of droplet during uh, uh, during the freezing, rime splintering, known as a Hallett mosser process, fragmentation during collision of ice particles. Uh, Ice particle fragmentation due to a thermal shock, uh, fragmentation due to during sublimation of ice particles, and uh, activation of uh, ice nuclei in uh, transient supersaturation during uh, around the freezing drop. Uh, um, historically, the first um, secondary ice production mechanism recognized was uh, fragmentation during droplet freezing. This process involved, uh, <coughs> this mechanism involves a number of uh, different uh, physical processes, and uh, I'll start uh, from, from them uh, to, to explain, uh, to, to go to the point where just how uh, this uh, uh, fragmentation during freezing may occur. So the, uh, this mechanism starts from freezing of uh, droplet, uh, this uh, the freezing uh, goes uh, <clears throat> can be split in uh, three uh, different uh, uh, time in, uh, time intervals. Uh, first, right after freezing, uh, there is a short uh, 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 during a very short period of time, a network of ice is growing through liquid water. Uh, this uh, is called recalescent stage or short stage which follows by freezing uh, stage when uh, the uh, uh, liquid which stays uh, between, uh, uh, which stays unfrozen uh, um, due to thermal exchange with the environment uh, gradually freeze. And during this time, the temperature remain uh, constant and, uh, and it's equal to freezing temperature. Uh, after all water is frozen, uh, so the temperature uh, uh, relaxed to the ambient temperature, and this stage is called is called uh, uh, ice cooling stage. So the uh, uh, the recalescent stage lasts approximately, uh, depending on uh, ambient temperature and depending on size of droplet, ranges from approximately one millisecond to uh, to one second and temperatures are lower than approximately uh, minus two degrees. The second stage, uh, freezing stage, uh, is much lower and uh, the, uh, it may go up to, up to several minutes or even more depending again on the temperature and the droplet size. So, and the, uh, the difference of, uh, of the time, uh, uh, time frame between these two uh, stages is uh, uh, up to two or three orders of magnitude. So if you write a simplified equation of balance, uh, we found that the fraction of uh, frozen uh, water during the uh, recalescent stage is, uh, is quite small. So that's, uh, again, a simplified equation. And uh, even at minus 40, by the end of the recalescent stage, the approximately 60% of uh, water uh, remains in uh, liquid, liquid phase. So uh, the next question which comes is uh, how does uh, droplet freeze? It may freeze uh, uh, outward or it may freeze uh, uh, freeze inward. Um, uh, and uh, that make a big difference. Uh, so uh, it was found uh, there were a number of uh, works uh, that uh, uh, during the recalescent stage, uh, the ice mesh <coughs> ice network, which is uh, uh, going through just uh, filling the, uh, the, uh, in, the uh, inside of the droplet strongly depends on temperature. At uh, uh, relatively high temperatures, uh, above minus five, it's a uh, flat dendrites uh, uh, which uh, gradually fill uh, the inside of the droplet. Uh, however, at colder temperatures, uh, at uh, lower, te uh, lower temperatures, uh, the and uh, net, uh, ice network becomes uh, denser and denser. Uh, for example, at minus uh, nine, you can see that uh, it's uh, it's quite dense compared to, you can see at minus three, minus two. 
So uh, I want to show a video uh, which was kindly provided by Alexei Kiselev from uh, Karlsruhe Institute of Technology. You can see how uh, uh, ice uh, network is growing through water. So you can see this is a, a, a little uh, ice uh, um, particle which um, nucleate uh, droplet, uh, which is uh, which diameter is uh, 300 micrometers. And you can see how uh, ice network is uh, going through. And it's interesting that only uh, uh, it's just uh, this uh, uh, ice uh, mesh uh, slushy ice, which is formed uh, inside uh, this droplet, it's only 15% of the total mass. Uh, so that's uh, how uh, a droplet freezes at the uh, first stage. So if it uh, freezes uh, inward, so it, the, uh, it may freeze uh, inward uh, or uh, just uh, or inward, uh, outward or inward, depending on, on temperature and depending on conditions. And uh, so, uh, uh, so this uh, high speed video shows uh, infra, uh, just the temperature of, uh, of the droplet during freezing. And what is uh, important, that's a recent pub uh, paper published in uh, JAS. Uh, coming from the group of Alexei Kiselev, and uh, you can see that uh, uh, that's uh, just during freezing. So what you can see here, so uh, this is the temperature of droplet before freezing, and uh, so do, uh, the recalescent stage comes promptly, and after that the temperature inside uh, remains constant, and uh, that corresponds to approximately zero degree C, so that's a uh, red light, and. Uh, just uh, during this stage, ice is uh, gradually uh, freeze inside, and uh, uh, so that's the end of uh, freezing stage. And after that, the droplet cools down to uh, uh, environmental temperature. So uh, if the temperature inside the droplet, for example, at that stage, uh, so unfortunately we, can, we don't see a variation, but if you just accurately look at it, and it was described in a recent paper, um, by uh, Klein Haynes. Uh, it shows that there are uh, small fluctuations of temperature inside, which you can see on the set of diagrams on the uh, on the right side. So uh, these grayish and uh, uh, lines, and uh, uh, so it's a different uh, uh, measurements of temperature inside uh, inside the droplet, and only one of them was highlighted by red light to to show. Uh, how temperature is changing. And uh, what we can see here uh, that <clears throat> the, temp uh, that the uh, temperature, uh, that the, uh, due to fluctuations of uh, temperature, uh, it can be converted due to Clapeyron equations into uh, pressure inside. So basically the fluctuations of temperature inside this uh, droplet, what, what, what we can see uh, during the, the freezing stage, stage they can can be converted into into pressure and uh, uh, so uh, based on this equation and what is interesting that the pressure can go to 100 bars and uh, and even over and uh, in some cases and uh, it can reach even uh, 200 bars it's basically 200 atmospheres it's a it's a huge pressure but what is interesting that uh, it uh, result in some so shape uh, uh, behavior. So uh, at that point, uh, it was recognized in the early works by uh, uh, Visage and uh, Keen and Fletcher. Uh, they did the same experiments, but by using a bigger droplets. Uh, these experiments were uh, performed in the um, electrodynamic balance, and they use uh, smaller droplets uh, of, of the order of uh, 300 micrometers. So what happened at that stage? So the droplet uh, droplet crack, and they release pressure inside, and uh, mm, uh, and uh, after that, the crack is filled by water, and pressure uh, increase again due to uh, expansion of uh, ice uh, during freezing. So that's the main mechanism. So the pressure, if uh, liquid is trapped inside the ice shell and ice is growing inward, uh, the pressure increases up to 100 bars when it reaches the, the cracking point and uh, 
uh, fracturing point and uh, so it may either shatter like for example in this case uh, uh, this line is discontinued so the droplet shatter or it uh, uh, result in some cracking and what is interesting when you look at uh, the progression to uh, down to uh, uh, cold temperatures uh, this uh, cracking is uh, less frequent at uh, warmer temperatures and uh, it's uh, uh, the pattern remains at uh, cold temperatures but the the cracking is uh, is going at uh, uh, much more uh, frequent uh, compared to uh, warm temperatures so uh, the increase of pressure inside may also result in deformation of droplets so uh, uh, there are uh, well uh, recognized uh, uh, shapes it may uh, result in the formation of bulges uh, so that's uh, this protrusion of ice or spikes or cracks or or just a split uh, so that's um, some some diagrams are made by Takahashi in 1975 how droplet may, may freeze and that can be used for identification of second race production uh, during uh, uh, from in situ measurements if you know I want to show uh, another video by uh, Wildemann which was published in uh, uh, physical review letters uh, the temperature was minus uh, minus seven and uh, uh, I want to pay attention that uh, the pressure was uh, quite low and at that pressure every single free, uh, freezing uh, droplet result in shattering which uh, does uh, which does not occur at higher pressure in atmosphere not every single result uh, dro droplet result uh, in uh, cracking at uh, temperatures at pressures uh, higher than uh, uh, like uh, 200 millibars or 100 millibars, so uh, it's uh, less frequent that, that, uh, at uh, that low temperature. That was recognized a long time ago by John Hallett, and uh, so uh, so we have to be careful when we are looking at those. So uh, we see the just initial stage of nucleation. So this uh, uh, wedge is uh, used to nucleate this uh, uh, the, this droplet, which is. Uh, um, uh, placed. Uh, this is about, uh, uh, I think it's um, uh, one or two millimeter uh, droplet, which is placed on uh, uh, super hydrophobic uh, substrate. So uh, I'll jump because it's a pretty long video, and I'll jump directly to uh, uh, to the point um, when uh, we see uh, start to see some 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 action. Uh, so. Uh, let me find this. Uh, so we come in closer, closer. Oh yeah, so just uh, you see the shattering of the first uh, droplet. And one of the splinter uh, just uh, impact uh, with the second droplet and you see in this uh, ice network uh, growing through uh, uh, this uh, droplet, the second one. You see this um, spike uh, growing out because pressure is increasing inside. And um, then we go to the second uh, point of uh, action. Uh, so I want to pay attention. At, uh, yeah, you see a splinter just going out uh, directly upward. Can anybody give me a feedback? Do you see it? Yes. Yes, yes. Okay, great. So just uh, it happened during cracking. So just uh, if you just uh, look carefully, just uh, after cracking, uh, it, it result in uh, this ejection of uh, one of the splinters. And now just I want to show you a second point, which is somewhere somewhere here. Uh, I lost it. Yeah, it's not easy to. Yeah, you see just uh, another splinter coming out. On the towards the uh, right side. Yes. Mm. And um, I'm going to show one one more.
Oh, you see wow. this uh, three splinters. Uh, Oh, and um, so just I go to the final stage of, of this section. So when you see the the shattering, just vigorous explosion of the of the drop. So that's a final stage. But uh, again, so uh, this is a. Uh, uh, less frequent at uh, higher pressure and uh, that just uh, such a vigorous uh, explosion you can see only at uh, very low uh, low pressure so uh, in reality uh, so uh, particle uh, droplet during freezing they uh, kind of uh, there are several different uh, mo uh, modes uh, which were identified by again uh, i got this video uh, from uh, alexey kiselov so uh, uh, we just they recognize breakup, uh, cracking. You see that uh, droplet just uh, crack and uh, just uh, they close back and uh, uh, the crack was uh, refilled or jetting. When uh, due to excessive pressure inside, uh, due to uh, the water is. Uh, uh, is jetting out of, uh, of of the droplet. So that's a uh, there are kind of uh, several different mechanisms of uh, generating um, secondary ice. So uh, here is a summary of experimental study uh, studies of uh, droplet fragmentation during freezing. And what is striking that uh, there were just a, a number of uh, different uh, uh, studies uh, made over just a big period of time. Uh, but uh, there is a big discrepancy. So uh, this uh, uh, red uh, uh, ellipsis, they indicate the uh, difference in uh, maximum frequency of uh, of shattering of droplets. Uh, so that's uh, that's uh, in, uh, in 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 percent. So you can see just a, a big big difference. So it it varies from uh, zero percent, for example. Uh, uh, Jim Dye and Peter Hobbs, they did not uh, observe uh, any, um, any, any shattering or fragmentation at all. And uh, various uh, other like Mason and May Bank, which uh, their work was criticized by pre uh, high concentration of uh, CO2 inside droplet, which uh, uh, kind of uh, support facilitate uh, shattering and uh, so um, it's a, it's, a, it's just a quite quite big uh, diversity of, of the results. So uh, it leads us to conclusion that uh, uh, first of all we learn a lot from those uh, laboratory studies that uh, 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 droplet fragmentation depends on many different parameters like droplet size, environmental temperature, uh, temperature of droplet, and uh, so ma make a, a huge difference. Air pressure, as I mentioned, and uh, many, many other uh, parameters which you can uh, read yourself. And uh, um, so uh, many different uh, um, uh, fragmentation modes were identified, like uh, splitting with a uh, few fragments, uh, explosive shattering, cracking, splintering, uh, bubbling, bursting, jetting. But because of uh, this large diversity of laboratory results, no physically based parameterization uh, seems to be feasible at that stage because we have to come to a kind of a consensus and um, uh, confirm the results coming from different research groups. Uh, so um, uh, at the moment, uh, this uh, parameterization is uh, hanging in the air and uh, we, we need more laboratory studies. Next mechanism is related to uh, splintering during ripen, uh, uh, rhyming, uh, and um, this mechanism is known as Hallett-Mosop process. And uh, early observations before Hallett and Mosop, uh, they showed if uh, 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 just an uh, ice target is exposed to the flow of uh, liquid droplets, and then downstream uh, uh, just uh, lots of uh, secondary ice can be can be found, and so uh, those works goes back to uh, works of uh, Macklin, uh, uh, Latham and Mason, Bader, 
And uh, uh, lots of uh, studies were performed by uh, Hallett at Mossop starting from 1974. And they found that, uh, uh, that uh, the uh, efficiency of this mechanism uh, has a narrow temperature uh, range from uh, approximately minus 3 to minus 8. And uh, uh, so it requires presence of droplets larger than 24 micrometers. And uh, so the uh, peak of uh, efficiency of the hallett mosso pro uh, process is around minus five. And uh, so uh, the drop velocity should be around, um, uh, it, it also depends on uh, uh, impact velocity of droplets. So it's around uh, uh, two, uh, two, three meters. So, and you can and just, uh, from there you can derive uh, what is this, uh, should be the size of fallen uh, collector, uh, 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 rhyming, uh, rhyming uh, uh, ice. So, uh, but uh, ironically, uh, until now, uh, the physical mechanism behind the hallett mosso process is uh, under debate. Uh, uh, Mossop in 1976 proposed four possible mechanisms. So it's a formation of shell around uh, a droplet accreted uh, on ice, so this uh, uh, is a conceptual uh, figure of this. Uh, after uh, contact with the uh, ice particle droplets start freezing, uh, create a shell, and uh, eventually it uh, uh, generate uh, ice splinters. Um, uh, the second mechanism is uh, the droplet uh, could be detached uh, uh, if it's, uh, the contact is, uh, is weak, for example, you can see that uh, this is a droplet is frozen on the surface of, uh, of ice uh, uh, and it may can be detached for uh, kind of it's uh, hit by, by another droplet or uh, uh, for whatever reason. Uh, uh, that uh, uh, some uh, splinters may uh, relate to uh, uh, ice needle which, which are growing at the temperature around minus five which are growing out of uh, uh, this uh, um, rime dice and uh, of course uh, rime uh, particle can be also detached so just you can see that uh, these uh, early pictures made uh, by Macklin they show just uh, lots of uh, structure on the surface of uh, uh, rime ice it, uh, uh, and uh, the shape of rime ice strongly depends on uh, uh, on the temperature and uh, uh, and uh, the velocity. Uh, however, what is interesting that a later uh, recent uh, um, laboratory studies by Emersic and uh, Paul Connell they uh, showed that uh, they didn't absorb any uh, splintering. Uh, during uh, during rhyming, so that's uh, that's uh, was uh, quite uh, quite interesting. That uh, there is a again, again so we're just uh, just uh, witnessing a big uh, variety of uh, uh, results of laboratory studies uh, coming from uh, from from different groups. And uh, for example, early observations by Latham and Mason show that uh, the maximum rate of um, uh, splinters was uh, like uh, uh, the order of 8,000 8, per one milligram of, uh, of rime. And uh, some uh, uh, experiments show um, just uh, uh, lots of uh, uh, splinters and some show just uh, nothing. So again, we have just a big diversity of uh, those um, uh, laboratory in laboratory studies. And again, so we learn a lot from uh, those experiments that uh, uh, rime splintering may depend on, uh, of course, depend on temperature and uh, uh, surface temperature of the uh, of the of the rhymer of the uh, just uh, particle which collect uh, uh, those droplets, uh, size, density, uh, mechanical properties, and but uh, kind of. Uh, the physical mechanism explaining uh, split, uh, this uh, uh, splintering during rhyming still on the debate. So we just we just uh, it's, we do not understand what's what's going on there. And uh, without clarifying the nature of this process, the development of physical base parameterization uh, uh, is uh, doesn't seem to be uh, feasible. Uh, now I just I go to <clears throat> another mechanism. 
um, which is a, a fragmentation of um, ice uh, during ice ice collision. Uh, so uh, this uh, uh, mechanism was proposed by Langmuir in uh, quite quite long time ago in 1984, and uh, later on uh, it was observed uh, uh, airborne by Peter Hobbs, uh, Takahashi, uh, Schwarzenbock, um, and but I should say that uh, by the time by this time uh, we were not aware of. Uh, anti-shattering tips uh, so and all measurements may, were, could be well contaminated by uh, uh, shattering artifacts and uh, those fragments uh, can be misidentified uh, as uh, uh, with uh, as uh, shattering artifacts and uh, ice or just secondary ice production due to uh, ice ice collision so we have to be uh, careful and uh, just be critical about uh, about these uh, observations and uh, so far, we have only two uh, laboratory studies made by uh, Wardiman in 78 and by Takahashi in uh, 95. So uh, Wardiman used uh, 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 natural ice uh, free falling from clouds. And uh, this ice was uh, uh, um, take by uh, high speed uh, video using uh, just uh, those uh, uh, old style uh, technology uh, using uh, using film, and when particle uh, hit the uh, the solid plate at the bottom, they were videotaped, and the number of fragments was uh, uh, was counted. Uh, Takahashi used uh, uh, two rotating uh, uh, rhymed uh, eye sphere, which were uh, connect uh, just uh, uh, connected uh, to the um, uh, brass uh, rods. And after impact, uh, those um, uh, ice uh, fragments, they precipitating uh, uh, down uh, just uh, to a special sub, uh, substrate and uh, it, they were counted. And uh, they found that uh, up to um, 800 uh, splinters uh, can be formed during such collision, uh, which seems to be just a little bit uh, too high. Um, so uh, what do we learn from those experiments that uh, uh, that uh, the collision of uh, the, the uh, secondary uh, production uh, efficiency uh, depends on uh, um, properties of uh, colliding particles such as size, mass, density, shape and uh, mechanical properties, uh, surface roughness, of course and uh, depends on uh, uh, air temperature because it uh, determines physical properties of ice like uh, like uh, crispness and uh, relative velocities and uh, kinetic energy of, of those impact and uh, um, at the moment we have only two uh, lab experiments and uh, of course it's uh, not sufficient uh, to uh, to develop any um, any physical base parameterization and uh, 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 for example uh, you can see I put uh, on uh, here uh, at the bottom of this uh, slide uh, different um, uh, uh, just uh, rhymed uh, uh, ice and the deposition grown uh, ice and obviously just uh, that uh, the mechanical properties of the surface of these ice particles are quite different for example, if you try to collide uh, such particle, uh, such particles with each other, or just uh, uh, deposition growth, it's very unlikely they, that they produce any significant number of um, uh, of secondary ice. However, collision of such particles may give a just a quite a wealthy number of uh, secondary ice. So it strongly depends on uh, uh, the age of. Uh, Rhyme because uh, uh, rhyme can be uh, just after aging, uh, it changed mechanical properties. So the fresh rhyme uh, and the aged rhyme, they of the same particle have different mechanical property, and that that should be kept in mind. And uh, those parameterization, which should uh, uh, which will be developed, should take this into account. Uh, next mechanism is related to fragmentation due to thermal shock. Uh, this uh, mechanism was hypothesized by uh, Cohen 
in uh, quite long ago, uh, time ago, so it's 1963. And uh, first time it was observed by uh, Jim Dye and Peter Hobbs in uh, uh, 60. Nine in the experiment when they just observe uh, uh, fragmentation of uh, ice particle uh, when the droplet was uh, frozen on its surface, and the mechanism is uh, such that uh, this uh, the droplet during freezing create a thermal shock on the surface, and uh, uh, due to uh, uh, thermal expansion, it create uh, stresses inside the ice particle, and ice particle. Uh, breaks down into a number of uh, small pieces. Uh, this uh, mechanism, uh, this uh, type of uh, secondarized production was uh, fragmentation of ice was uh, also absorbed by uh, by Hobbes and uh, Farber. And um, so there are again only two uh, quantitative uh, qualitative observations of um, secondary ice due to this mechanism, but uh, there is uh, no so far any uh, quantitative characterization of this mechanism. So, uh, no, uh, the significance of this mechanism uh, remains unknown, and uh, it's not even clear how to, what's a kind of, uh, should it be embedded, uh, implemented into uh, numerical uh, simulations of clouds. Another mechanism is related to uh, fragmentation during sublimation. And the first time it was absorbed by uh, Mossop uh, uh, when he just uh, 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 observed detachment of 20 micrometer uh, rime uh, from um, uh, under microscope uh, from a, a sublimating particle and he Identify it as an unexpected phenomenon of sec uh, just uh, like uh, which may lead to secondarized production. There were uh, a number of uh, uh, lab studies uh, coming from uh, 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 John Hallett Laboratory and uh, Laboratory of Marsha Baker, and uh, so they found that uh, uh, one of the uh, that uh, this mechanism can produce a quite significant amount of uh, secondary ice particles. And uh, one of uh, uh, the conditions uh, which is required for secondary ice is that uh, the original ice uh, should have uh, some uh, inhomogeneity in shape and that it, it, it should have necks uh, which uh, may res uh, during thinning of and uh, evaporation of uh, ice, they may result in uh, 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 kind of uh, thinning uh, those next to the stage when uh, these ice particles uh, separate. And uh, so, uh, initial uh, shape of ice is uh, critical uh, for fragmentation. That one of the uh, um, uh, one of the important parameters. And um, so, however, if you look at uh, uh, sublimating ice collected uh, in uh, in real clouds, we see that uh, the sublimation work this way, uh, this way that it tends to minimize the surface area. And uh, uh, so, along this way, for example, uh, this is a sublimating columns and plates. Uh, obviously, they won't produce any secondary ice because they uh, start to have uh, oblate shapes and uh, no necks, uh, which can result in separation of ice, can be formed here. Uh, it's uh, also unlikely uh, that uh, bullet rosettes uh, produce too many fragments because uh, the center of ice is uh, kind of is uh, uh, shadowed by uh, those uh, um, uh, uh, bullets coming out from the center, and uh, so they are uh, shrinking first. So, for for example, you see that's a later stage of uh, sublimation of bullet rosettes. Uh, that's uh, but the primary candidate for uh, secondarized production during uh, sublimation. Uh, uh, dendrites and stellar crystals, and uh, again, so kept columns also, just to can see how they sublimate, they may produce uh, maybe just at most uh, like two uh, two fragments and uh, also 
but uh, but not much. So we have to just uh, probably just uh, uh, the, uh, this uh, mechanism is uh, uh, limited by um, the uh, dendritic type uh, crystals and maybe just some some rhyme. So here's an uh, but uh, if you are talking about aggregates, that's that's different. Uh, uh, so uh, aggregates usually connect uh, uh, in, a, in a kind of uh, they form uh, lots of inhomogeneities. They form a, a small necks, and uh, of course, uh, aggregates during sublimation may produce uh, many eyes, uh, secondary eyes. But this process should be uh, identified as deaggregation. So basically, you simply just uh, go back to original. Uh, number of ice crystals which aggregate is form of. So uh, one of the, uh, so what's the significance of this mechanism? So uh, in order to, uh, uh, the, this uh, secondary ice formed during uh, uh, sublimation uh, turn into uh, result in uh, ice multiplication, they should re-enter back into a uh, super saturated environment because uh, this uh, mechanism is active only in undesaturated environment. And for example, if you have uh, just uh, ice producing a uh, layer and it precipitate down in uh, and start sublimate uh, underneath the cloud, resulting in uh, uh, many uh, secondary ice particles, they slow down and eventually uh, they anticipate uh, uh, they anticipate it to just sublimate completely and go to complete sublimation unless they re-enter uh, another cloud. But this cloud should be just exactly the location of this uh, accumulation zone of secondary eyes. And uh, otherwise, if it's uh, like a situation is like this shown on the left, uh, they simply sublimate in a clear, uh, clear air and uh, without any secondary eyes production. And uh, so, uh, of course, if just uh, in uh, convective clouds, uh, there may be some uh, uh, secondary production in uh, a region of uh, entrainment inside, but uh, it depends how much time uh, is, uh, how big is uh, this uh, entrained uh, bubble and how quickly the situation uh, uh, go back to uh, the, the humidity inside this uh, uh, bubble inside. Uh, entrained bubble go to saturation and uh, uh, just how many particles will be produced. And uh, so again, so that's very special conditions uh, which are uh, required for uh, this uh, mechanism to be to be active. Of course, uh, there may be some detrayment, uh, but you have to re-enter uh, the cloud at very specific time to make uh, this mechanism efficient. So, uh, uh, what do we learn uh, so far? We learned that uh, particle shape uh, have a, is, uh, is significant. Uh, relative humidity, of course, uh, uh, determines the rate of uh, product, uh, secondary production due to this mechanism. Uh, air temperature is important, fall velocity, ventilation coefficient, but um, again, uh, the, uh, there is some kind of uh, discrepancy between the, 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 the results. And uh, we have to say that uh, those, uh, for example, this uh, 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 just uh, artificially grown ice particle, which uh, kind of uh, quite different from those which can be observed in uh, uh, in uh, in real clouds, and uh, this is a kind of it's a shaved ice. It's it's not uh, deposition grown ice, and uh, so. Uh, we need more lab experiments to conclude uh, the significance and, uh, of this uh, mechanism. So, uh, next uh, mechanism is related to uh, activation of um, ice nucleating particles in transient supersaturation. And uh, first, uh, uh, this uh, mm, uh, going back to uh, uh, laboratory studies. Uh, Muchnik and uh, Rutko and uh, Dai and Hobbes uh, in 60s, they observed a halo uh, around, formed around uh, uh, freezing droplets. So th this halo they interpret as uh, just a, a result of uh, activation of, uh, uh, of CCN activation around freezing droplet. And uh, uh, 
Dye and Hobbes provided a physical interpretation of this. So the temperature of freezing drop uh, uh, of uh, freezing droplet goes to zero uh, degree C to the freezing point, and this temperature will be different from the ambient uh, temperature. And uh, this droplet will work will result in a flow of water vapor outside. So basically, it works as a thermodiffusional chamber, and it creates a region of high supersaturation in the vicinity of, of the droplet. So uh, you can easily calculate the kind of the uh, the peak of the saturation using a simple assumptions. And the theoretical uh, uh, framework was uh, developed by Nix and Fukuta for spherical droplet uh, for uh, spherical shapes. And uh, for example, at um, minus 15 degrees C, they found that uh, maximum uh, maximum supersaturation will go up to 15%. That's a huge supersaturation, which may activate uh, uh, lots of uh, tiny, small uh, droplet. And Gagin in 72 proposed that uh, uh, this uh, region of high supersaturation may result in activation of INPs which were not activated at lower supersaturation. And uh, uh, so basically, uh, along with the liquid droplets, they may also activate INPs. And uh, uh, later on, uh, Razinski and uh, Gagin, uh, they uh, made a very neat uh, lab experiment. They put a, a droplet on a thread inside the tank with a controlled environment inside. and. Uh, uh, during freezing, they uh, observed uh, so uh, a dew formed, uh, condensed water formed on this uh, glass. So it's it was exactly in this. Uh, they put this glass plate at the location of this maximum supersaturation. So that's confirmation of this mechanism. And uh, they also observed uh, uh, ice nuclei just formed on this uh, sodium silicate solution. So, which uh, precipitate down, and uh, uh, in uh, for the fallen droplet, uh, this uh, mechanism was uh, observed by Iwabuchi and Magona in '75. They documented it, uh, and they use actually this mechanism to identify the moment of uh, beginning of freezing and the end. For example, this is a, a track of fallen droplet, and it leaves. Uh, so what do we see here uh, in transit, uh, in scattered light? It's a track uh, of the droplet filled by activated, uh, tiny, small droplets activated in the transit uh, supersaturation area. So that's the beginning of freezing and that's at the end. So which is, which is quite interesting. And similar experiment was uh, um, uh, reproduced by uh, Hakaran in a uh, pie chamber, uh, uh, so it was published in uh, uh, ACP uh, 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 journal. And uh, so uh, uh, they use uh, uh, just uh, a laser light to identify uh, this uh, spicule, that's a reflected light, uh, la uh, laser light uh, from, uh, from droplets. And that's, uh, it is different from uh, scattering light uh, from uh, uh, from droplets. So droplets, uh, for example, in this area, the the scattering is much more smooth compared to uh, uh, compared to the uh, uh, scattering on uh, on ice crystals. And uh, um, so, but unfortunately, uh, this uh, was not quantified because uh, the conditions were slightly artificial. They use uh, snow max and uh, silver iodide uh, to uh, generate those uh, those crystals, and uh, I, I will uh, also pay your attention on uh, two interesting uh, works uh, just uh, recently coming uh, from um, um, uh, from uh, uh, just uh, published in ACP and uh, and Journal of Physics, Numerical Journal of Physics, and uh, so in fact. Uh, the droplets, depending on the size, uh, they uh, form a wake uh, behind, depending on the re uh, Reynolds number. And uh, this, uh, the area of high supersaturation will be just uh, well scattered. And uh, kind of, if the Reynolds number is uh, 
is uh, too high. And uh, again, so uh, to conclude this uh, mechanism, so I want to say that uh, no lab experiments uh, quantifying uh, secondarized production during, due to activation of INPs and transient superstitution have been performed until now. And uh, the significance of this uh, mechanism is not well understood. And I should add that if this mechanism is active, it uh, uh, won't, uh, won't work at warm temperatures. You need really big uh, temperature contrast uh, to, uh, to activate, uh, um, to, to generate uh, high, uh, this transit uh, super, uh, super saturation uh, region with a high super saturation inside so you need a, a, at least 15 uh, 15 or 20 degrees uh, uh, difference so uh it's uh, just the the bottom point is it's won't anticipate it in the temperature range between uh, warm uh, warmer than minus 10. uh now i want to uh, go to in situ observations the Objectives of uh, in situ observations uh, can be just identified as follows. Uh, so we have to ide somehow identify uh, SIP particles, secondarized production particles. Uh, so what is uh, kind of uh, uh, what's the way of doing this? Uh, somehow we have to identify regions with the uh, active SIP because we can find secondarized production when uh, the, uh, uh, the production is over. And uh, next is uh, we have to somehow figure out what is this uh, uh, mechanism responsible for the absorbed secondary ice particles and uh, identify conditions. Uh, just that's the most important one is uh, identify conditions as associated with SIP. So we, we can uh, figure out what are the necessary and sufficient conditions. And what are the problems? So just uh, first of all, it's uh, uh, we, uh, uh, the measurements, in situ measurements are essentially uh, non-Lagrangian. It's uh, Eulerian. Uh, small sampling uh, volumes. We just uh, dealing with a needle, uh, uh, train, uh, needle uh, kind of uh, sample uh, transit through cloud, and we just uh, based on this we are trying to judge about what's going on inside. Uh, phase the, phase the, uh, discrimination of small uh, particles is still problem. So just we, it's it's a big problem I did identify. Uh, whether uh, uh, particles smaller than 2040 micrometers, uh, whether they liquid or or solid, uh, it may be just solid, uh, just uh, frozen drops, and uh, uh, measurements are still contaminated uh, by uh, shattering artifacts. So we have to just uh, lots of lots of issues related to to this. For example, uh, that's uh, one of the just uh, early measurements were related to. Uh, uh, um, sampling with instruments uh, having uh, uh, tips like like this, so uh, ice particles after impact with uh, uh, those uh, um, uh, hemispheric domes, where they were just uh, uh, bounced uh, towards the sampling uh, sampling area indicated by this uh, red uh, uh, area. That's a laser beam. Uh, they shatter and they generate a uh, lots of uh, small um, uh, small uh, uh, artifacts, small size uh, ice particles which were misidentified as uh, secondary ice. And after introdu introduction of uh, anti-shattering tips, which is shown shown here, you see that uh, there is uh, almost no bouncing. Once in a while, you can see that uh, some uh, ice particle hit this uh, tip, but uh, it's all compared to this one. It's uh, and uh, we found that uh, uh, kind of comparisons of measurements of this and uh, uh, of uh, instruments with uh, these type of tips and that type of tips, they uh, can uh, re reduce the number of uh, small ice particles smaller than uh, 200 uh, micrometers 100 times. So it means that our past measurements overestimated uh, the consideration of small ice particles up to 100 times. So that's a significant improvement of uh, our measurements. So uh, kind of 
we use uh, what kind of assumptions should be done in order to identify uh, secondary eyes. So just we first of all we consider that uh, secondary eyes production at the initial stage uh, of uh, they should have a small they should be small and uh, during some time uh, these uh, secondary eyes particles <clears throat> they remain associated with the environment of their origin and uh, these uh, lead to the uh, assumption as the, the sec uh, next assumption that small ice particles can be used as uh, tracers of uh, environmental conditions favorable for secondary ice production but that's only under under this assumption because uh, the just uh, secondary ice particles may also be just have a, a bigger sizes so we are limiting uh, the mechanism which can be just identified with this uh, uh, type of uh, secondary ice production so uh, this uh, cartoon shows uh, that uh, the beginning of secondary ice production uh, if they just form uh, on uh, uh, on splinters they uh, still associated with uh, uh, the environment of the origin, but later on they can be diffused by turbulent mixing or turbulent uh, transport and uh, they are not associated with uh, uh, the environment of the origin. The temperature may be different, the, uh, the uh, 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 mix phase, uh, the dro uh, droplets may just uh, uh, du uh, evaporate due to wagon bergeron findizing process and um, so uh, just many, many other processes may, may relate. So that's a busy slide and I want to jump into this uh, in order to find uh, the, uh, you can look at it later on, uh, the correlation time when uh, small ice uh, crystals, sec uh, secondary ice is still associated with the environment is uh, is estimated as less than 100 seconds. And during this time, assuming that uh, 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 it's a mixed phase environment, uh, the splinters uh, may grow up to uh, 100 micrometer uh, ice particles, assuming that uh, they uh, have a hexagonal shape, uh, that uh, just uh, um, uh, hexagonal uh, columns. And uh, so uh, here is an example of uh, uh, fresh, uh, freshly formed uh, secondary ice uh, on the left and uh, aged uh, pristine ice on the on the right and these and that uh, images they have the same scale and we can see that uh, so the age of these ice crystals is estimated as 10-15 uh, minutes and uh, uh, the images on the left so that's a zoomed in uh, image of, of expanded image of this one so it's estimated as less than a kind of uh, hundred uh, of the order of uh, less than uh, two minutes, roughly. Uh, assuming uh, that uh, they are growing in a super saturated, uh, is uh, saturated over liquid environment. And uh, obviously during 15 minutes, the, uh, this uh, uh, ice particle may just uh, 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 may be transported in a quite different environment. They precipitate, they may be brought up by updraft and, uh, and diffuse and um, uh, kind of uh, many, many, and uh, the shape may be also changed. So here is an example of uh, uh, one of example of our measurements of transit through uh, cloud regions with secondary ice uh, production. So that's quite busy diagram. The measurements were performed in the mesoscale convective storm uh, in, uh, uh, in the vicinity of uh, uh, Cayenne, in French Guyana. And these grayish uh, vertical uh, regions, they indicate uh, uh, zones uh, identified as uh, regions of secondary production. And uh, so where uh, the concentration of uh, secondary ice may go up to 600 to a liter or close. And you can see that spatial uh, size of those zones uh, is uh, quite quite small. It's of the order of a few hundred meters to, to kilometers. And uh, uh, so it's associated with the presence of uh, large drops and uh, uh, that's uh, these are regions usually uh, related to uh, regions of high turbulence and uh, associated with uh, usually uh, high ice water content regions as well. So 
the way how they appear uh, on a high resolution imagery is like that. So uh, that's a sequence of uh, uh, images sampled by CPI probe. And uh, you can see uh, lots of liquid. And between them, you can see tiny, small ice crystals of the order of uh, starting from like uh, this one, uh, 31 micrometer and up to like uh, several hundred micrometers. But uh, all uh, ice crystals, secondary ice crystals here are limited by by 100 uh, micrometers. So it's a uh, tiny, small crystals embedded uh, in, uh, in uh, this liquid. And uh, uh, on the right, uh, uh, aged ice crystals in, uh, just sampled in the same area. So I simply separated this uh, uh, ice crystal. And you can see a uh, uh, grapple and uh, large uh, side uh, columnar crystals, uh, like uh, columns. And um, um, so and the temperature is minus five, and uh, the concentration of uh, these tiny small ice crystals, of secondary ice, is going up to uh, several hundred per liter, which exceeds uh, the potential concentration of uh, INP of uh, ice nucleating particles by four orders of magnitude. That's obviously cannot be just a nucleation of uh, um, uh, ice particles. And uh, uh, along this way, you can see uh, uh, droplets with uh, uh, shape, uh, modified shape uh, during freezing. The, those are frozen droplets, which we were talking at the beginning of this lecture. And uh, some droplets were uh, split or just uh, broken. Uh, they may generate uh, uh, some, some, some splinters uh, during this. So, and all this together is indicative of uh, presence of uh, 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 of the uh, indicative of this mechanism of shattering uh, during uh, during freezing, but uh, somebody may argue that uh, presence of grapple uh, that this may be also a halide mosop uh, process by by association of uh, that uh, with the uh, uh, presence of uh, of, of grapple in this area. However, for example, uh, the next zone from uh, from the same cloud it doesn't contain grapple, but we still these tiny small uh, secondary ice particles in between these giant uh, ice ice crystals. So just I uh, put them on, on on the diagram on the right, and uh, so uh, there is no grapple here. Then that's uh, obviously not. Uh, uh, it does satisfy meet, meet the the criteria of uh, halet mosa process, which requires uh, presence of of grapple. And uh, uh, these. Uh, Observation were taken over Ontario at temperature minus two, which is uh, again uh, away from the Hallett Mossop uh, mechanism uh, 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 temperature range. And the uh, secondary ice uh, has a shape of plates. It's not, not needles, which is anticipated in uh, Hallett Mossop because it's active between minus five and minus eight, which is a range for needle uh, and col uh, which, uh, uh, columnar growth. And this is a plate growth in between uh, these uh, big drops. And uh, no, uh, we don't see any any rhyme dyes. Uh, uh, we see rhyme dyes, but we don't see um, we don't see gr uh, grapple, and uh, this rhyme is, is aged. And uh, so uh, what is interesting here, that the thickness of this uh, plate, it gives us inside uh, what uh, the size of the splinters could be, because they are optically homogeneous. It means that the ice particles which were they formed on they uh, should be less than the thickness of these plates. Otherwise, we would see the optical inhomogeneity. And I should note that uh, the thickness of all these plates is less than the smallest droplet surrounded, uh, this, uh, uh, surrounding these plates. And uh, so the thickness of this uh, plate is associated, uh, is uh, estimated as 10, 15 micrometers. It can be easily measured. And so that uh, leads us to conclusion that the size of this splinter should be less than 10 micrometers. 
And I should say that such splinters can survive only in supersaturated environment. Otherwise, they supersaturated over ice. Otherwise, they will rapidly sublimate. So that's a kind of important condition that for secondary ice that uh, environment should be sub sublimated uh, if uh, it's a result in a secondary uh, in a splinter production. So because bigger ice, uh, uh, for example, if it's a ice ice collision, it may it may survive in a different condition. So uh, another I want to show another extreme temperature extreme. This is secondary ice production at minus 27 degrees C. So this is a time series of uh, uh, ice concentration measured by uh, estimated from uh, CPI and uh, uh, assessed from 2DS uh, size distributions. And uh, these uh, two uh, zones with the tiny small ice crystals, they correspond to this uh, reddish area, whereas this bluish zone, they uh, correspond to area with uh, this uh, background big ice, which you can see that's uh, lots of rime ice here, but the temperature is extremely low. And that's uh, one of the first observations of uh, uh, secondary ice at that low temperature. So it uh, expands our knowledge about when secondary ice production can be observed. So uh, uh, this slide shows that in many cases we see uh, that uh, secondary ice uh, is a uh, observation of secondary ice is associated with uh, fragmented uh, drops. And we see a uh, lots of frozen drops, uh, which concentration well exceeds the concentration of uh, INP particles. And these drops are frozen uh, by tiny, small. I, we don't see uh, any big crystals uh, on the, uh, maybe with the exception of this one, but uh, uh, the rest are just. Uh, um, um nothing uh, no big crystals uh, even, uh, just attached to this uh, uh, drop so they were frozen by splinters and uh, they may generate uh, the secondary ice during cracking or during uh, uh, during the, during freezing so uh, that's kind of you know for sure that uh, this mechanism is most likely a cure which we cannot uh, say much about uh, the rest mechanisms. So where we are now? I want to kind of uh, quote uh, Larson uh, uh, from his uh, 90, uh, 1981 paper. Uh, so uh, that's a quote about SIP, that uh, this phenomenon uh, which generates the widest variety of speculations in regard to the mechanisms, uh, it, it is where the most disagreement exists and it is where many dubious explanations have been put forward. It is also a phenomenon where direct observation and measurements are expected are extremely difficult. So uh, here is a summary. Uh, that's a conceptual diagram of the mechanism which we discussed uh, today. And uh, so that's a fragmentation during freezing, how it most a process, uh, ice uh, collision fragmentation, ice ice collision fragmentation, uh, co uh, fragmentation during thermal shock, uh, sublimation and activation of INP in transient supersaturation. And uh, so, but are there any other mechanisms? along this way. So they were un uh, unconfirmed by other research groups studied by Charlie Knight, published in uh, JAS paper in 2012, and the recent one coming from uh, 18th ICCP in Pune. So, uh, so it may be not limited by only these six mechanisms. And uh, uh, so, uh, so far, we most confident about these two mechanisms, but we uh, there is no direct evidences about uh, presence of these mechanisms in uh, uh, in uh, clouds. So 
we have uh, a lots of things to learn yet. And uh, regarding uh, accommodation of uh, SIP in the numerical weather simulations, so at the moment, uh, most uh, numerical simulations are biased towards a hallowed muscle process. And uh, other uh, five mechanisms are underrepresented in the numerical simulations. Many uh, numerical uh, weather predictions are not using uh, secondary ice production at all. And they generate ice only based on uh, primary ice nucleation. There are a few uh, NWPs, numerical, uh, numerical weather predictions, which are uh, using Hallett Mosa process, but not, not all. And uh, uh, obviously, uh, the existing parameterizations of other mechanisms, you can tune in many possible ways uh, those. Uh, secondary ice production due to mechanism, uh, six mechanisms, and obtain right concentration of ice. So that a little bit, this situation is a little bit concerning. And uh, I also want to emphasize that there may be some, some other mechanism which we are not aware of about yet. And um, where do we go from here? Uh, so we are talking about next uh, 10, maybe 20 years. So uh, normally the process uh, should go this. We have to invest uh, efforts into in developing of uh, lab facilities, focusing on uh, uh, studies of uh, secondary ice uh, production mechanisms. And um, this should result in identification of necessary and sufficient conditions and the efficiency of uh, the, those mechanisms. And each of those mechanisms it depends on many, many different parameters. It's, uh, for example, uh, usually uh, how it most process is, uh, is represented as uh, uh, only uh, um, um, depending on the temperature, but it just includes in many more uh, parameters. Uh, identify, uh, so after that, we have to come up with a theoretical framework and de develop physically based parameterization of SIP. And after that, it should be confirmed from remote sensing techniques and uh, in situ measurements. And after that, introducing uh, numerical weather prediction. So uh, jumping from here to here uh, may be a little bit dangerous. So uh, that should be really, we have to be just uh, uh, careful and cautious when we just uh, trying to explore this uh, process. So that's my last uh, 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 slide, and I think I overuse my time, and uh, I ready my uh, to answer to address your questions. Thank you, thank you, thank you Alexei. This is really fantastic. Uh, uh, information regarding the secondary ice production and uh, uh, we have a, a few of our colleagues and uh, other students uh, joined here uh, and they would like to first of all have some discussions with you after that I think uh, we will have um, Mahin will be taking up uh, questions for you uh, we have um, uh, Dr. Bipin Kumar, uh, Dr. Anupam Hasra, uh, and Dr. Shiv Sai Dixit, and uh, Julie Pasquier. Um, she has specially requested to have discussions with you. Maybe we shall start with her uh, first. Hello, Julie, are you there? Sorry, do you hear me? Yeah, yeah, we can hear you. Um, sorry, I just had a problem with my mic. I, I, I missed like the few last minutes. Okay. Uh, so we are in the question session now. Oh. Yeah, yeah, we are in the question answer session, and uh, uh, um, Alexi is available to answer any any of the questions uh, regarding the lecture. Please. Um, actually, I don't really have a question, but more like a, a, a discussion point. 
yeah. um, like in my feeling, it would even make more sense to try to not do parameterization like for each process, but more like a general parameterization using environmental or atmospheric conditions prevailing to saying kind of if it's possible to have a secondary ice production. What do you think about this? Uh, <clears throat> I probably just uh, share my presentation. Yeah, one of the kind of I want to emphasize that this one. We need to find necessary and sufficient condition. Yeah, that's uh, possible instead of uh, splitting and uh, atomizing the secondary ice production mechanism and splitting into six or whatever, seven or whatever number of those mechanisms. We can go to, we can bypass and go to these uh, necessary and sufficient uh, uh, conditions. And, um, and in this case, we just uh, use uh, seed uh, secondary ice production as a black box. No, it's a possible. It's a, it's it's possible, but I I think it's a it's a longer route. Uh, so you simply kind of generate. Uh, I cannot even consider how many possible conditions you have to generate to to reproduce it and uh, to to study it because uh, uh, it may depend on. Uh, uh, Droplet size distribution, temperature, uh, pressure, uh, shape of ice crystals. Um, it may not uh, require a liquid phase. Uh, so that's uh, that's quite a bit. No, but that's true. Uh, but it's it's. Uh, I think it's possible. But on on the other side. Um... Basically, a lot of this mechanism, or at least the three kind of well-known droplet shattering, ice ice collision, uh, and uh, high mass up, they require collision between two ice parts, or oh, ice and water, or ice and ice. So this is maybe also a starting point, or not? Yeah, it's a kind of. Uh... If you are talking about, for example, this, so you just uh, uh, droplet fragmentation, uh, there's a, it results in a chain reaction. You just generate splinters which freeze uh, other droplets. Uh, um, so you have to have uh, conditions related to uh, concentration of droplets to make this uh, <clears throat> uh, chain reaction efficient. You have to have droplets of right size. Uh, yeah, that, that, that's uh, again. So that's that's possible. Mm -hmm. uh, it, it, it requires collision, but uh, this collision of, of different type. For example, here you need collision of ice and, and droplets of, of right size, and here you have uh, to have uh, have to have a collision of ice particles with the right mechanical properties. Yeah. Mm -hmm. Yeah, but. Uh, uh, Alexi, the first ice formation in the cloud itself is a uh, challenging problem, right? Yeah, you need ice. Uh, you need ice, a primary ice, or you yeah. need, uh, for example, in mesoscale convective systems. Uh, after this uh, initial stage, when you generate primary ice. The role of primary ice may uh, uh, may take the aged ice. That what happens in mesoscale convective systems, uh, like in the fro or in, in frontal clouds, or just uh, in a mature stage of convective cloud. So you have pre-existing ice, which is uh, filled the entire cloud, and there are lots of big uh, drops or, or droplets of right size, and they uh, generate uh, secondary ice. 
uh, for example, like uh, like this. So just uh, you have collision of uh, like uh, you see this uh, droplet uh, collide with the pre-existing ice, and it, it generates uh, uh, splinters. And uh, so after that, you just uh, proceed with uh, like, uh, for example, this is a little ice particle. Uh, it collide with a droplet and, uh, and result in the shattering. Yeah, we have, uh, I think, Mahin, we have some questions, right? Yeah, there is a question from Dr. Sudarshan Bela. I already posted, uh, posted that question in the chat box. Uh, so what is the possible effect of SIP concentration on rain amount and initiation process? I didn't uh, understand your, your last, uh, your, your last day. Yeah, uh, Alexei, uh, what he's asking, uh, Dr. Bela, um, what is the possible effect of SIP concentration on rain amount and uh, oh, initiation rain. process? Rain. Yes, 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 yes. Uh, we are doing uh, lots of uh, numerical exercises to understand uh, the mechanisms of uh, formation of high ice water content. And we are coming to conclusion that secondary ice production plays a key role in uh, formation of high ice water content. For example, uh, just I bring it up here. So uh, that's a mesoscale connected system with uh, lots of, uh, like, for example, here you can see that uh, ice water content can uh, go up to two gram per meter cube, but it may go even higher up to five. Uh, grams per meter cube. That's probably highest uh, which we measured uh, so far. And uh, the small uh, when you generate secondary ice, it uh, release uh, latent heat, and uh, it uh, uh, generate uh, secondary convection above the melting layer, and uh, it brings up more material. Um, in solid form. So the these secondary ice particles, they uh, go to the higher level and uh, they generate these uh, regions of um, high ice water content. If we turn off the secondary ice production mechanism, in this case, uh, it results in bigger ice particles which precipitate fast and they do not generate uh, this high ice water content uh, regions, at least in our simulations. But uh, Alexi, that something like that can also come from the high CCN, right? More, uh, more droplets and uh, getting into the, um, the mix phase region and uh, generating more uh, uh, SIP. Yeah, but usually as soon as you get a uh, concentration of uh, secondary ice production, what is interesting, what we learned uh, so far, that in mesoscale convective systems, uh, like in Darwin or in uh, French Guyana, Darwin, Australia, there is a very little uh, Mix phase and mix phase exists only in uh, regions of uh, very strong updraft. For example, here we have updraft like five meters per second, here it goes up to 10 meters per second, and here we have uh, just uh, this velocity is sufficient to maintain mix phase in the case of secondary ice production because when you have concentration of secondary ice up to like few hundred per liter, the glaciation time is very short and uh, all water vapor is depleted by uh, these uh, secondary ice particles and uh, due to wegener bergeron pindeisen process and uh, it turned uh, into ice uh, cloud very quickly. So um, 
this activation of CCN, of course, there may be secondary uh, activation of CCN inside the cloud. And um, I suspect that in few cases we observed it um, uh, in, the, in the observed clouds, but uh, and generally uh, very little. Uh, for example, you can see Rose Mount icing detector here. It's mainly flat. Okay. Yeah, uh, Alexi, there are also maybe uh, Anupam, would you like to ask some questions to Alexi? Yeah. Uh, thanks, uh, Alexi. Very nice talk. Uh, I have just uh, uh, one or two questions. So, which one, uh, the SIP, you have uh, shown the six mechanics. So, apart from this, uh, document fragmentation or life centering, which is actually which one uh, most suitable for the drop or important for the drop? Uh, I just kind of. He is. Uh, yeah, I will. I will just repeat uh, his question. He is asking which uh, SIP is more uh, uh, prevalent in the tropics. Isn't it uh, Anupam? Yeah, yeah. yeah. Droplet fragmentation or uh, rhyme splintering? Droplet fragmentation or rhyme uh, splintering, yeah. right? Yeah. Which one is most? Uh, you know, just uh, I. Uh, <clears throat> what is interesting, if you look at uh, uh, historical, from a historical perspective, uh, the secondary ice production due to rhyme splintering was always uh, associated, uh, just uh, concluded based on association with the presence of rhyme, uh, of rhymed ice and uh, gropal. Yes. And uh, this is not really conclusive. And uh, just I'm a little bit concerned about those past measurements, which uh, concluded that uh, secondary ice production due to rhyme splintering uh, takes place. Even uh, the current observation, so we always, uh, from in situ measurements, we are doing it based on association, but we don't really see the real mechanism which can be reproduced many times in laboratory conditions. So, for example, the logic of all these uh, studies is based. I see this uh, shattered or just fragmented uh, drop. And I see in the, in the vicinity of this uh, secondary tiny small ice crystals. And from this, I make a conclusion that the shattering of drop droplet during freezing result in all this ice but in fact the mechanism may be completely different so i just i want to emphasize that all our observations are in city observations are made based on association of something what we see with the something what we find so just kind of again so just I want to be careful with this, and uh, and uh, every time when we are making a statement, we are just uh, uh, just we, we, we just we have to be, be just a little bit uh, cautious about uh, about those conclusions. So to address your question, I don't know. So all our ma uh, just conclusions are based on association, and uh, I really. For example, in this case, I see uh, gropal and I see shattered droplets in the same volume. And which of this mechanism uh, uh, of, of secondary ice production is associated uh, with uh, uh, shattering of droplet or uh, rhyme splintering? I just it's it, it, it's hard to conclude. And for example, here. Uh, I don't see any, uh, there is no just uh, uh, any uh, gropal here, but we see lots of uh, kind of uh, tiny, small uh, secondary ice particles. So what is this mechanism again? So it's it, it, it's hard to say. All what I can say that I can see some, some droplets of that size, 
of such and such size. I can, uh, I can see small ice crystals of, of such and such size. So we have to kind of uh, can, uh, change our strategy in order to uh, un, uh, kind of explore the mechanisms of secondary ice production because the aircraft is flying at, uh, at a speed of uh, 100 or 200 meters per second. And we are going through all these uh, uh, cloud regions within a fraction of a second. And uh, based on this, we are trying to kind of using a kind of a tiny small bone uh, to just uh, we, we want to reconstruct the entire uh, entire dinosaur, which is a kind of we are dealing with a lots of ambiguity along this way. Thank you very much. Last, last one question. The scattering of uh, freezing drizzle droplets by the bubble box, like a thick salt drizzle droplets, how is it important in the water tropics? Because most of the uh, sea salt may come from the uh, bubble box. So, how it can affect on the scattering of freezing droplets in the, for the formation of a cycle? I, I couldn't get uh, this time <laughs> to repeat. Can you can you repeat? I don't think uh, Alexi got the question. Yeah. Uh, uh, Alexi, the scattering of uh, freezing droplets due to bubble box. I am talking about the scattering of freezing drizzle droplets by the bubble box. It's the influence of sea salt. Bubble. Droplets. Yeah. Bubble. It drizzle, it drizzle drops uh, bubble burst, right? Yeah. Yeah. Uh, you know, just uh, uh, again. So, just uh, we don't know this. Uh, there are several different uh, mechanisms which we recognize so far. It can be splitting with a, <clears throat> a few fragments, like uh, <clears throat> like for example, this one. What you can see here, you see two big uh, fragments. That's a, uh, this is a big, uh, uh, like uh, two or three hundred micrometer uh, drop. But there may, <clears throat> there may be many more tiny, small uh, splinters here. And uh, for example, what you can see uh, here, just I, I want to show you that there is a, just some material getting out of uh, this droplet. You see, the, there was a jet of water. Mm, mm, mm. Yes. And we, and we don't know what happened with this. Oh. Uh, like uh, cracking. Again, so just during cracking, it may also produce a number of tiny small splinters, which we don't see. On this video, uh, because of low resolution, uh, as we just con uh, just uh, I showed the, uh, in one of the slides that the size uh, uh, the size of the splinters is estimated as 10 micrometers, and uh, it's it's really hard to resolve it because of limited depths of field on uh, such such videos. You you, ne you need to make a smash, uh, special arrangement. And uh, for example, this uh, jetting. So what happened to this liquid water uh, after jetting? Whether it uh, freeze or whether it because uh, uh, there may be some some tiny small ice crystals coming from this uh, uh, ice mesh or sl slashed ice inside. So again, so it's so many uh, just uh, questions to uh, uh, which remain unaddressed and so many things to learn yet. Yeah, there are there are yeah yeah. Thank you, Anubam and. Uh, Thank you, Alexia. Yeah, there are there are two more questions, Mahin. Please yeah, see. Yeah. Uh, 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 Tara, just before we proceed, so just I want to say because I overuse my time, I can uh, answer your questions uh, longer. If uh, your people decide to to stay longer, I will be happy to. Uh, you know, yeah. To talk. yeah. Yeah, yeah. Only, thank only you. Only two, uh, only two questions we have. Uh, there is first question, uh, second question from Dr. Artur Zivagian. Uh, what should be the special resolution in NWP models for absolute parameterization of SIP? Adequate, adequate parameterization of SIP. 
Yeah, we use a uh, high resolution uh, model uh, with a resolution to 150 meters. It's Canadian model. And um, so, and we uh, uh, also just uh, uh, explored uh, the effect of, uh, mm, uh, of of the resolution. And by the way, there is a nice paper coming uh, out of uh, from uh, Greg McFarco group, and it was submitted to um, JAS and uh, ACP. So just uh, uh, follow those. Uh, uh, where they just uh, explored in a, in, a, in a great detail the effect of uh, uh, of uh, the resolution and uh, so there is effect but but it's not that significant so and uh, in Canada we were using a high resolution model down to 200 meters 250 meters uh, there is another question by Dr. Pradeep Kumar. Uh, do you see difference in SIP production rates in marine and continental clouds? You know what is interesting that uh, uh, that uh, very similar. So uh, these measurements uh, and uh, and uh, this uh, time series of uh, concentration of ice, uh, which we observed right above the melting layer in uh, in tropical mesoscale convective systems. But exactly the same thing we observed in mid latitude uh, clouds. Uh, in uh, I think I have it. Uh, yeah. So, for example, these measurements were done in Ontario, in mid latitude clouds. So that's a red red dot shows those measurements, and you can see just. Uh, Exactly same things in terms of uh, spatial scale of secondary ice, and it's uh, right above the melting layer, a temperature from minus one to minus minus five. Yeah, thank you. I think this answers the questions. Uh, Alex, mm -hmm. I, I, I have one query here. Uh, do you think the charging of the ice particles? Uh, may have some effect on the SIP production. I mean, SIP, uh, I mean, uh, ice multiplication yes. or ice, ice production. Yeah, definitely. Uh, there is a, a, a lots of uh, electrification going on, but uh, you know that uh, uh, cloud electrification remains. Uh, the, this is a big uh, unexplored. Uh, or just openly explored uh, area, and there are uh, lots of uh, uh, possible mechanism of char of charge separation. And uh, uh, it is uh, established that, uh, for example, shattering of ice uh, results uh, in uh, charge separation, but uh, and which was uh, actually observed and uh, documented in uh, in uh, in laboratory studies, uh, but. Uh, at the moment, uh, how what is the feedback of cloud electrification on uh, secondary ice production? It's uh, basically mostly remains unknown. Okay, thank you. Uh, we don't have any question in the uh, YouTube chat box. Okay. Yeah. Okay. Anybody else wanting to ask some question to? Or uh, nobody is raising any hand. So, Alexi, thank you so much for your uh, kind of consideration to give this talk. And uh, we, we had uh, some nice interactions also. Uh, we appreciate it very much. And uh, on behalf of everybody from IATM and all those who are viewing, thank you so much for the kind of uh, kindness in getting up early and giving us uh, this talk. Thank you, Tara, for inviting me. And yeah. thanks for the follow-up yeah. questions. Yeah, thanks to Mahin and uh, I, uh, all others who have joined uh, uh, to help with this. And um, I think uh, uh, we, we can request to stop the live streaming now.
Thank you. Thank you. Thank bye -bye. you. Thank bye -bye. you. Bye. Bye bye.